and I'm sitting down, you know, that's what like with people taking pictures of me and shit. I'm like, I'm a guy sitting down. What's in, what's interesting here? Nothing like. Well, aside from that, I think I'm rolling and I'm ready to go if you are. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure podcast. Um, today, we're welcoming the Tasmanian devil of the drum kit, the musical mastermind, and the best dressed when it comes to white overalls, uh, Mr. Ian of Regional Justice Center and Military Gun. Thanks for joining me on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now that now that we started, I'm like looking at my background to be like, do I got anything weird? <laughs> no, you're good. I, I've had I've had people record in the most crazy places, whether it's their car or you know they have like the the pile of dishes that they have to do in the kitchen behind them. So yeah, I mean my room is definitely a mess. Uh, I just was like, uh, I was like, I didn't know how wide the shot was gonna be, so I'm like, right. oh, I can see all the way over the TV. All right, what do we got? <laughs> We got some my nighttime sleep aid right there and my NyQuil that I crank out every night. Oh, but. you got like a your your little sleep station of of different. Yeah, yeah. And whatnot. I mean, there's just like a little area that is kind of like random things. So I don't know. Right. But I think I think I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, send send me the shot before we go live <laughs> with it, so that way I can be like censor that over there. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna throw some cinematography on a, a very bare bones podcast. Um. But for uh, Ian, for the few folks at home who might not know who you are or the bands that you're part of, can you give a proper like introduction? Like, hey, I'm Ian. This is where I'm based, and these are the bands I'm in. Uh, yeah, I'm. My name is Ian Shelton. I am from Seattle, Washington, but I live in LA now. I play in Regional Justice Center, and I play in Military Gun. I do a band called Sex with a Terrorist. I do. I occasionally have played in a band called Self Defense Family. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's about it. I yeah. also I make music videos. I yeah. guess those are the the cornerstones of what I got going on. Yeah, Ian is a very very busy man. So I really appreciate your time uh, to come and jam with me on the podcast. Um, there's some new Regional Justice Center and Military Gun that is coming down the pipe that uh, that I am very excited to be chatting with you about. You've been gracious enough to give me you know the secret URLs and links and. Uh, yeah. Honestly, I and I don't just say this because you're on the podcast. The the newest military gun that you sent me that I don't know if it will, it will be out in full by the time this episode comes out. It's already, you know, within my favorite top 2021 releases. It's amazing. It's Love to hear that. Very, very sick. Um, before we get yeah. super into the music conversations, we got to do our 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 scoped bev check um okay so I, i'm trying to make it the standard that the guest goes first so how about you start things off and tell me what you're sipping on all right so i guess i'm double fisting here <laughs> so i have some corporate coffee that will not be mentioned in this cup but i wanted to hide that mm -hmm. and then um i got my red bull over here i guess i wanted to do both these to highlight the uh cocktail that uh by 3 p.m <laughs> causes me like insane anger so right yeah are at 3 p.m every day i'm just livid because yeah. i've drank too much caffeine <laughs> caffeine and i just got nowhere to go with it yeah there, there's been a you know red bull seems to be a an ongoing um common bev to be checked on this podcast um it, it looks like you're very og not sugar free just uh very original um yeah i mean it's funny i mean i don't actually know when red bull came out but i remember when i started drinking it in fifth grade okay and i was like we I'd go to the corner store every day that I could get the 250 or whatever to get the the uh, Red Bull, and I was yeah. like, it's crazy that I've been drinking this beverage that I've never even thought tasted good <laughs> ever for like I don't know 20 20 something years now. Yeah, <laughs> stupid. Yeah, a lot I was, of wasted money. Yeah, I um I I don't mean to plug another podcast, but I had I, I listened to a really good episode with um the the CEO of uh, Liquid Death, which is a uh like a oh, yeah, yeah. bev company down in the states, and he was just talking about how certain bev companies will like market to like the the target audience is like older, but then it's it's for those kids who, um 
So if they're marketing to this certain age group, all the kids that look up to those kids are like, oh, yeah, it's cool to drink Monster or Red Bull or things like it's that. It's like if you market something to an 18-year-old, a 13-year-old loves it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, no, that's very, very cool. Um, my Bev for this podcast is kind of a kind of a serendipitous thing because I was thinking I, I haven't done my, like, I guess, like, go to the fancy organic uh, grocery store and get all, like, the cool Bev's. So I, I was feeling kind of sparse. So I was like, ah, I could just do this. And then uh, my wife's coworker, when I dropped her off at work, was like, hey, if you go to Rosso, which is like a local uh, coffee place here in Calgary, they're doing uh, free drinks if you order it with oat milk. And I was like, all right, you don't have to tell me twice. So there shout out to Rosso. Sponsored today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unofficially. So. Shout out to all your local coffee homies. Um, but Ian, uh, let's get into the uh, conversation. Um, the intro question that I ask all my guests is just very basic on how they got into heavy music uh, overall, because I think context really matters on how you know people got onto the path of wanting to be in basements with 50 people and have ear, ear blasting music. Um, so take me back in time. Tell me some of the formative records and moments for you, and we'll kind of you know, wean into things. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it was interesting. So, I mean, I, the kids that I grew up with were, like, starting to get into street punk, and I had, like, always loved, like, some 41, Blink-182, Slipknot, like, things like that. And so it was, like, kind of that natural next step into something more obscure, something else. And um, my mom's uh, friend's son left a CD wallet at my house, and it had the addicts, oh, the casualties... Okay. It had just all this street punk in it. And uh, I mean, that was like super formative. That was like the CDs I listened to for like the next three years after that. And um, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. It was like, love the addicts, Dead Kennedys. A lot of, I love a lot of West Coast music specifically. I remember when I was in like high school, I always thought I was like, man, New York's whack. Like for some reason, when I was like like twelve year old me was like yeah like I only like West Coast and like England and whatever and just stupid, yeah. but uh for some reason because that was what I was exposed to most you know was that but even then I loved the Casual Season I I believe they're a New York band so uh tough to say yeah yeah I I do you think that that was partially due to I think that there's some things growing up where you're like um you know oh it's like there's there's all these rivalries with like certain like geographical yeah you just areas. want in on it something you yeah. want in on some sort of beef <laughs> and i would say like i definitely was like a kid that uh, like as a little kid like i love beef i think i live so much in my own head that i can create problems with people yeah and so like i just sometimes i want to have a beef or something <laughs> i think i've i've i've, I've pretty well curbed that in my adult adult life i think yeah. that I, I don't do that now but as a kid give me all the beef yeah i think like growing up um you know growing up in winnipeg um it was always this constant thing through sports where it's like oh we don't talk to people from saskatchewan which is like the neighboring <laughs> province and then moving to alberta it's like you know you either cheer for the flames or the oilers and it's like this constant thing and i'm like does this really matter like and, sports and was... rivalry is the funniest thing because it literally is just are you from there yeah <laughs> or do you or do you just randomly decide to root for that team right okay then that's the base completely of your bias it makes no sense yeah <laughs> yeah i'm i'm all for like cheering for the the team where you're from despite if they're a hype or a good team or not yeah. um but yeah it, it it's just crazy on how like people like feel like they want to be involved in the drama or, or the war that is on what fill in the blank. So it's, fun. I mean, yeah, that's the, how we get to the culture that we currently have. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. People feeling like they need to climb up Capitol walls when there's stairs right next door. It's like, geez, what's going on? But yeah. We won't get too far down that rabbit hole because <laughs> things will get pretty dark. Um, so uh, the, the band that you're probably most known for regional justice center is kind of like, um, a band that it seems I I've gotten to see you guys, uh, only once. And that was, uh, with ingrown, you guys came through Calgary and yeah, it's, that. it's been pretty interesting just like seeing the different evolutions of the band and how things have, all, you've kind of been the nucleus and there's been different members and well, I, I haven't been the only nucleus. Like that, oh, okay. that thing is like, like, um, I think people really, you know, because I do most, all of the songwriting and whatnot, but 
there is a lot of other people who have consistent hard work invested in RJC. For sure, yeah. And with this like new record, like like Steph Jerkova's one, Alex Haller has been there from first show, has maybe missed, you know, three shows ever. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's there 100% of the time. Che Heiskatone, like like those are the people that I consider to be like the core of RJC. And there's a lot of auxiliary people out on the edges. Mm-hmm. And so, but yeah, like with that, like, I mean, it always is because I do the, the songwriting and things like that. And I'm the one who does the interviews, you know, it, it does. I think there is that, that conception that I'm the only one around, you right. know? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when this podcast was going all online because the world was shutting down, Steph was one of the uh, earliest kind of like first people to come on and do it through this means. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It never felt like, Oh, like, are we allowed to talk about this? Because like, <laughs> I'm Ian, but yeah, I, I think that there, there maybe is this idea of like, yeah, Ian does all the songwriting and maybe the pr- interviews and promotion, but yeah, like there's a lot of people that play a part in that. Um, yeah. Was the plan from day one? Cause I remember when Steph came on, she was saying, you know, the, the fact that there are people, that will do guitar for this tour or do bass for this tour was the idea since day one, like let's have a band that can be as active when we can tour and just like kind of be this, uh, um, musical chairs kind of dance. Or did that just happen out of just like necessity? It was more necessity than anything. I mean, the earlier tours were pretty consistent until we, Alex and I really wanted to just do more and more and more and more. Right. And, uh, you know, the, my big thing is that over time, like I've done so many bands in the Northwest and none of them were able to do even half of what I wanted to do. And so like the part of the starting of the band was to get to a point where I could actually do as much as I wanted. And so like with that, it was just like, I want to do this tour and this tour and this tour. And it was like, well, I can't do that. It's like, okay, well we got to swap out something here and like, you know, just make it work temporarily. And I kind of tried to just be inclusive of whoever ended up playing with us as well to be like, you're also in the band, you know, like your time's invested now into this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, you know, that's not like you're, there's very few people who I wouldn't invite back into playing, you know? And so that's why we've done things like the big group shot and stuff like that is because just like, I wanted to give shine to anybody who's investing their time into this thing that like is, you know, a large part of my creative brain. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's very cool that it's kind of like regional justice center is like more of, you know, it doesn't have like a concrete lineup. It's more of like a family and there's people that like can come in and out. And like you said, like you have the big group shot of everyone. I think that's very, very cool. And I think, I think a lot of people recognize that because it is very uncommon just in, you know, heavy music or DIY music right now to have that like flexibility and not a, um, oh, well, it's my, like, I'm the second guitar player. It's like, oh, if I can't do this tour, like I want the band to still do shit. So I think that's very Well, that's the thing is like everyone benefits, you know, like uh, from a band that is active and the, and the, the, the like ecosystem of bands that like surrounds RJC have benefited from it. You know, like, like me being able to go and start military gun and having like an audience so instantaneously and, you know, and then everyone else being able to launch bands and we use RJC to promote Apple white punitive damage video prick, you know, like it's, it's, it is a benefit because we've been able to be as visible as possible by just, you know, switching things out when they need to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on that note, uh, you, well, I guess let's hit on this first. So I I think the thing that I've noticed is that like, especially during this time where, you know, touring isn't a reality, people are trying to opt for like doing, uh, you know, more music and things like that. And, um, and I really have enjoyed all of the releases that you've put out kind of during this time, like the KKK tattoo, and then just like doing the collab with justice from chapter and rice. Um, do you think that those pro- like small singles or, or you know, two song promos would have happened without COVID, or have those been ideas? Yeah, those were those works? were those were done pre COVID. Um, it was January of last year, so it's been a year as of like last week that we recorded right. Regional Jurdis Center and KKK Tattoo because that was one session that both those songs came from, uh, or both those records came from. 
And uh, originally, I was going to put a KKK tattoo on a comp because I just thought it would be hilarious to do um, a song that's almost as long as an entire RJC record <laughs> on on a comp just because right. it like I love abusing format. I think that the attachment to format and things like that is pretty funny and irrelevant in the modern day. So, you know, putting two minutes on a seven inch, like putting six minutes on a 12 inch, like putting four minutes on a comp track is something that I am personally, uh, I just love fucking with people. So that's kind of where, um, where my head was at with that. But then we were just like, we started working with closed casket for the LP and it was like, well, what if this is just like a good way to, um, you know, start our relationship, uh, you know, label and band. So we ended up giving that to them and swapping out the comp songs. So. Yeah, no, I think that was good. And, you know, like off of the new record that, that I've been listening to for the past week, uh, I noticed that uh, none of those releases were put onto that. So it's not like, hey, we did the two songs and then they jumped onto the, the full length as well. They're kind of like their standalone pieces. Yeah, in hardcore, I feel like it would be weirder to do the um, like returning singles type right. vibe. Where, yeah. Whereas melodic music, like I feel like I could fit more in an album. But uh, I don't know, it just would seem weird to me personally. I mean, I guess I just write a lot. So to reuse stuff is not as um, important to me. I'm, I am curious uh, with the regional Jurstice Center. Uh, do you think that will ever have a, a live iteration where you, you guys have the band and then Justice is, is doing you know the vocals? I would personally love to see that come to fruition. Uh, I would love to do that. And we've talked about different ideas for that. Um, but I'm not sure that it'll ever happen. I mean, the way that I phrase it is like, it's gonna that's a better version of rjc and and if <laughs> if why would i ever allow there to be a better version than the version yeah. with me singing so like uh because it's like all right if justice pops on stage and sing sing some songs then then he leaves then i'm left sitting and singing <laughs> like that's that's not a good performance anymore you know like uh and so i i i would be hesitant to actually do it live we're trying to plan some stuff but we'll see if it ever happens so yeah yeah i think I, yeah it would be like um i i think that there's those constant things where bands will have a feature of like someone doing a guest spot and then it's almost like the guest spot kind of overshines on the actual vocalist and you're like yeah, i kind of yeah. wish we we're going back to so-and-so doing that so i've exactly. been in bands where that's happened been like man like our vocalist just like crumbled by by that person spitting that. So it's a weird balance. Yeah, exactly. Act. Yeah. Yeah. Live, it'd just be like, I can't follow justice, you know? Yeah. Like that's that's why would I want to? And I'm sitting down, you know? That's what like with people taking pictures of me and shit, I'm like, I'm a guy sitting down. What's in what's interesting here? Nothing. Like uh so yeah, I just don't think that um that we could do it in a live setting like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um you know, just going off of that, that was something that I was thinking about today because I'm always trying to think of like different content things that I can do around different themes in hardcore. And we we run a playlist and, you know, it's a constant like I'm always trying to think of like, oh, like let's do a playlist of like bands with a single syllable band name. And then we do that, mm. and, you know, we do stuff like that. But I was like, should we curate a list that is bands that don't have a front person that, you know, it's members, mm. you know, on the guitar, on the bass or on the drums, but no one's like running around with a mic, like uh, a Looney tune. So do you think that like, you know, do bands like, it's clear that bands can still have success and do really well without that. But there is definitely like this, you know, as soon as there is someone to like be that free flowing kind of like commander in chief of the show, um, wh where are your thoughts at with, uh, with having, you know, you know, I, I don't know if you'll ever do like the full like code orange, like, OK, I'm off the drums and I'm fully on the mic now. No, I mean, I, I we definitely talked about that because I do think drumming and singing is kind of miserable sometimes. <laughs> Just like sure. with how like the, it can create such a weird tension with the audience, like with how far like playing hardcore fest and stuff like that. Like people are so far from me. Mm. And um, but no, I mean, I definitely don't think that we'll ever switch up, especially now that Military Gun exists. I think that like it would be really whack to, to, to be a like freestanding vocalist for two bands. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Just to shout out some, some of my favorite 
uh, no standalone singer bands. I would say currently Dream Decay and um, and Ingrown are the two two best out in yeah. the within hardcore and hardcore adjacent things. Yeah, definitely Ingrown. Like I don't know, like you know, seeing both of you guys for the first time, it was like hey, man, like this show is popping off. And like you said, there's not someone like like standing in front of your face to do that. But yeah, there is a there is an extra barrier or challenge there as someone to like kind of try to lead in on a certain part where you're like, I'm so far back and doing the drums. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, it's hard cause you want to give people the cues of like, here's what you do. But, uh, at the same time, like, I don't want to be like a dude, like two stepping to any band, let alone <laughs> RJC. So, uh, it's not going to be the reality anytime soon. Yeah. I think we were talking on the on the DMs about uh, some of these things because like Reno, Regional Justice Center is this like very cha- chaotic, fast to the point style side of your brain, and then the other is like Military Gun. Um, you know, a lot of the songs, you know, it's very tried and true that Regional Justice Center songs are you know not not like you said like the KKK tattoo song is like a lot longer than some of the other material. Um, yeah. So when you're writing a lot of this stuff, is it just like, like how do how how do you like think about some of the 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 transitions? Because some stuff just like I don't even know how I could go from like this really slow like like drudgy like through the mud guitar riff into like something that's super fast. Like my brain doesn't go there. So I'm just kind of curious on how you orchestrate things and and like think about doing that and be like oh this is too long let's like like hard chop half of this song talk to me about some of those things so i mean the initial instinct for all of every music i write essentially is to do everything too short i've 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 referred to myself as a short form songwriter um and that's just that's the instinct you know sometimes i have to be pushed uh to be told like this part you you know you're got to hang your head on it a bit you know like let's stay here for a second um i don't know i i never really think about it's one of those things that's just the natural intuition of the songwriting that i never really think about uh you know like oh you got it i definitely think about cause and effect of parts such as like kkk tattoo was a song that was being built movement by movement you know where it was like you know it kind of has a structure of like blast d beat blast pogo beat you know like yeah, yeah. I was trying to establish different I was trying to like give a different feeling and it like slows like every slow part every fast part gets slower until it gets to the breakdown but um but yeah I don't know I don't really like think about it too much it just kind of ends up being the way that it naturally comes out you know yeah Yeah, I think that Taylor Young he produced this uh, produced Crime and Punishment cool and also engineered the um regional Jurdis center and kkk tattoo session and he i mean he really pushed me to be like that's monotonous that do that more times you know like he was kind of like poking and prodding around in the songs and and um you know he definitely had a lot of input on this record yeah yeah and i think it's it's cool to have those people be like oh i don't know to to not have all this um you know babying all your songs half the time it's like i just am writing the songs and i'm gonna like it seems like there's a constant like output for for music for you and i think it's really cool to see like um my personal favorite off of the new record is conquest uh i okay, really cool. like that it's really... one of the that'll be the the like second single oh out, okay so cool. cool yeah i just i liked you know how there's a lot of you know fast switches in the middle of the song but the the front and back are kind of like bookends of one another as far as yeah, having yeah. a similar thing so i would say that's like one of the rjc structures Sure. Is okay. like um like uh amphetamines also has that where it starts with a part, there's fast in the middle and then it ends with the with like the longer version of that part, you know? Yeah. Um and that's definitely like a structure that I really enjoy. So Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's crazy. I'm just like looking at the the times of everything and you know, I, I I think, you know, throughout my entire journey through hardcore it's like i think my patience for for song length has definitely gone down uh as Mm -hmm. my age has gone up um but i do think that there is like you know it's it's almost like uh with the last song and punishment like it being two minute it it feels like a different 
um, listening experience versus like, okay, that was a minute. That was 55 seconds or, or well, whatever. Well, I think that, that, that a lot of that runtime comes from that outro on it too. So yes. it's, you know, and that, that's definitely something that was like, um, acts like that was very intentional. So it's uh, it definitely provides a different feeling than a lot of RJC stuff. Yeah. Like the, the drum, if, if you chopped the drum kind of just like solo sections at the beginning and the end, it would definitely be under two minutes, but without it, it's yeah. like, it's pushing it. Um, is there, is there like a, a, is there like a length of song uh, that you would be like, there's no way that RJC is ever going to do a three minute song or a two and a half minute song or. Well, I mean, so like KKK that. tattoos four minutes and two seconds. Yeah, that's true. So that was a push. And, and that was inspired by, I think that, you know, when I was coming up, there was a tradition of, when power violence bands got to a certain level of like after so many records they like wrote a really long song and a lot of time i think they were overly indulgent in that in the length Mm -hmm. and weren't really motivated where it was just a lot of like boom (laughs) you know right yeah i don't like that (laughs) you know like i like that if for 10 seconds and i don't like that for you know, however long. And so, you know, I was thinking of, of things like mind erasers, like conscious, unconscious. And, um, I don't know, just like, I feel like every fast core band at a certain point had a five minute song at the end of their record. And I was like, man, those, those bands did it so boring, mm-hmm. regardless how much I love those bands, you know, uh, and there would be really super amazing parts, but then the indulgence of the length, like you could tell they're motivated by length instead of song, you know? Right. For like sure. when I set out and I wrote a four minute song, I wanted to write a, like a six minute song because my intended goal was to write a song that was longer than institution. Yeah. But at a certain point, I was like, no, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> this is monotonous. This is getting stupid. Like um, th- I'm being motivated by the wrong thing other than songwriting. So that's why I ended up at the length. And, and I think a band that did that perfectly also was Wound Man. With, they did this song called Rolled. Okay. And it's like, it's only it's like three something minutes long but it's like just another epic song where it's just like part after part and it like has movements and it you can feel a reference to a part before but it like feels new and uh but yeah i mean i don't know i there's definitely i wouldn't say nothing i wouldn't do anything at this point i could write a 15 minute song i don't know yeah i think like um you know uh it comes i was chatting with a friend of mine uh there's this band from toronto up here in canada called real world and they put out an album and the you know the second track or the first real track after the intro is like pushing on six minutes and i wasn't expecting that on my first lesson but just like yeah it took me on a ride and i was like are we into the four minute mark and like i'm not bored by this song so i, I think- mean that, that's what it is i mean like even like gate creeper dropping that that record that they just did um yeah, like a yeah. couple of days ago that last song the 10 minute song has such defined movements that this it, there's songs within the song it, regardless if it's on, in one track it, it it it's refreshing and it's keeping moving and it's not stagnant you know yeah i i think it's it, it's a it's a weird combination of being self-aware and not like am i doing this like you said like just to hit a certain like minute mark or does the song have juice and we're just squeezing that until until there's nothing left in the lunch. Well, it's like it's like if you're motivated by concept over songwriting, then then it's going to be a weak song but a strong concept. But if you are can you know start concept and then have good songwriting to accompany it, then it'll it'll land hopefully. Yeah, um, I feel like that's a good uh, kind of segue. Um, I was listening to one of the latest Axe to Grind podcasts, at least by the time of recording this episode, and they were talking about uh, entryway bands of like into different regions and. Uh, they were talking about power violence, and I don't think that you're um, waving a flag of like I invented this subgenre of hardcore. I mean, like I think that. probably a lot of people don't even consider us to be a power violence band. I call us a hardcore band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, but I, I think that like that different breed of it, at least for me, that that like opened the world for me to be like, oh, okay, like there is hardcore that isn't as you know, verse chorus, verse breakdown or, or whatever. Like there's more of yeah. like, you know, uh, like a streamlined way of thinking. So is that a little strange? Like, obviously like you didn't intend to like, we're going to change things or, you know, shake things up. But like, is that weird for people to be like, yo, you were the reason that I got into like this 
this huge leg of heavy music that I didn't know existed before you guys? I mean, I don't get told that. I mean, that that's an honor. If so, I mean, you you do hope that. I mean, the only goal in starting the band was I was like, I'm gonna start the band that nobody's gonna like, <laughs> because it's the subgenre of hardcore that I enjoy the most, and I've loved since I was you know 14 years old, and and nobody's really doing this at like a, at a, any sort of scale. I didn't think people were gonna like Regional Justice Center, and um. And it just kind of ended up happenstance, especially the way that we've like ended up so far into the hardcore scene where people aren't aware of like blast beat music that that's the case. I mean, I'm grateful that that anyone listens at all. But if they're checking out bands that we like find important or classic, like that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really cool that, um, yeah, just like, you know, people have done seeing a gap either in their own local scene or like you know just the overall s- spectrum of hardcore and like um they're they want to fill that gap with their music versus just like i wish there was more bands like this in in my area or things like that like if you see a, a gap like you should just start that band yeah, um, yeah speaking of other bands that you've started um military gun kind of was this you know, huge thing that kind of came out of nowhere, at least for, you know, someone on the outside. Um, Can you just talk to me quickly on like how the idea of that came to be? Was that just like an itch to like write music that wasn't as chaotic and you had these riffs or demos where you're like, yeah, it's more like, I don't know, like actual, like music that (laughs) like (laughs) a a normal person would understand. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was just off the cuff, really. Um, the way that it kind of shook down was that when the RJC tour um, got canceled and Steph was here, we were like working on songs for the RJC LP. I was teaching her some stuff, and I was just like, I started like playing this kind of black flag guitar riff, and I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I was like, you should just like write a bass part under it, you know, like write something. And then Steph did this super major you know so i'm going you know it is that song kept talking and and so it was this mixture of like noisy with like this major bass line under it and i was like oh this is really cool like let's just let's just record something because i do all the my demoing on my iphone and um and with that like i was like um like let's just record a full song right now like we have nothing going on like we're waiting for you to have to take you to the airport hours from now like let's yeah. just like record something and we didn't have lyrics we didn't have anything and i think i was just complaining about a punisher earlier in the day and then we just like recorded a full song and um i went back after i dropped steph off at the airport i wrote another complete song with vocals and then i went back the next day and wrote another song and it was just like this thing where i was like suddenly when the purpose of like my year was disappearing i was creating a new purpose uh and that was how the band started yeah Uh, that's very crazy like um so how are you I I I must ask how are you doing these demos just through your phone because i think this is the perfect this is the perfect i'm gonna i'm gonna show you um this this, all the audio listeners need to check the time so they can get the the visual lesson yeah. with that. Uh, okay, so the GarageBand app. Uh, oh, I got. I don't. I I do everything live. So this isn't like. Um, this is my new phone, so I don't have a ton of songs on oh, okay. here. <laughs> but um, let me see here. Oh, I got it quick one sorry this is not good tv right now (laughs) yeah no there needs to be um i need i'm just trying to find a uh dead air soundbite to kind of fill the gap when there's these gaps like this okay so really what it is is you know i i start i just multi-track it all i use the 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 phone as the mic the interface the mixing like this is the only thing i use is Mm. just the just the phone and I, um, I set the, the, the freaking iPhone behind the drum so that it's pointed at the cross section between the toms, the kick and the snare. So there's less cymbal bleed. So it's kind of below the, the line where you're going to get a ton of cymbals. Newer iPhones pick up cymbals. So I've used a bunch of different iPhones now to try to experiment. <laughs> um, 
and and so you can get really good like like clean sounds that convey the ideas that you want and all i do is you know i or click in the songs there's gaps where there's supposed to be guitar i'm just doing a little click i'm bad at playing to an actual click so i just go by my own tempo internally but um that's it i mean i just you know start lay down a drum track and then i go and record a guitar track record another guitar track record a bass and then just yelling into an iphone by the end of it so that's uh i mean that's the thing is i've been trying to get people when i did um i did this video like early in quarantine that was just me performing like rjc stuff like chopped up and creating a new song i um did it all on my iphone and uh and i was trying to like I emphasize it to try to give people that tool to be like, you can create whatever you want. Like I don't always respond to every DM being like, how do you do this? But, uh, uh, you know, I, I just think that it's, it's an empowering tool to just do whatever you want. And, you know, and and there's auto tune on it. You know, if you know the key of the song that you are in, you can find your melodies if you're working to establish your voice. And that's something that I was doing is, you know, I was like, um, setting the auto tune up and then going and laying down a track that was kind of nonsense and then being like, oh, okay, that's kind of what I'm actually trying to do. And then yeah. re-sing it that way. Yeah. And uh, I just think that it's a really powerful tool that, that people should, should get on. So. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you giving the quick demo there. And I think, you know, I think for people to get into anything, whether it's music or playing video games, like accessibility is such an important like layer to that. Like I was listening to a podcast where they were talking about, you know, all the VR and AR stuff that's coming up and just like the end, the entry point to just like play video games in a few years is going to be like massive because you need to get a crazy rig for your room. I I can't even play Warzone because it's (laughs) the entry point is not existing. It's just like, Oh, get on and just get destroyed until somehow you accidentally log 10,000 hours being destroyed to actually get a couple of kills or something right yeah yeah i i've i've really like th- that's a huge thing especially with big blockbuster video games where it's like i might want to play this for the story but like i won't even touch multiplayer because i will be years behind everyone else even if yeah. the game's only you know a few days old i play um, fortnite but i'm not good at it so <laughs> what's your uh fortnite skin uh i have the mandalorian currently oh cool yeah so that was just it came with the, the battle pass so oh, i see yeah i haven't been playing much i've been working too much and then the rest of my hours are at the <laughs> practice space so right um but going back to what we're saying like i think you know a lot of people um build up writing or recording music to be this very like bougie thing like oh i gotta get the fancy you know speakers and the crazy interface and all the stuff it's like if Ian from Regional Justice Center is recording demos on his iPhone, whether it's a well, iPhone. and the, the the Sex with the Terrorist record is was made on the iPhone. Yeah, like that's the, that's the released record. Are the yeah. instruments were all from the iPhone, and so yeah, I mean, and and people ask me like, was that record on a four track? You know, I was like, no, I could. <laughs> I bought an interface, and I'm so technologically adverse that I don't know how to use it i know how to use it for this for podcasting right but like to actually use GarageBand on a computer and like add an actual inner like it's i can't do it i'm just i'm not smart enough yeah you know i don't have the brain for it so that's why you know this being the mic the everything is like that's that's what you need you know yeah and i think like especially right now like there's some signs that shows might come back this year but um just in the meantime like using like the time that you have to like really either learn new skills or like just write as much music as you can i think is really important um i wanted to touch on uh so the 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 first uh single that military gun did uh, was w- with the video for dislocate me and you know anyone that knows you that knows you're you know a director and you do lots of music videos for a lot of you know bigger bands um what was the ch- the biggest challenge at least with that video where you're trying to direct but also perform in that video um t- tell me i mean it's it's definitely things. not something that i perfected on the one shoot i'll tell you that much um <laughs> I mean, it was hard because, I mean, I looked back at the footage, you know, especially the part where they're like fucking and I'm like, I wish I could have like told them less this, less that. But, you know, there was no time to watch to review footage that that was a a challenging shoot because one, we're dealing with COVID precautions. And then two, 
you know, we're dealing with the, this couple and like having a lockdown set and trying to make sure that they stay comfortable right. uh, throughout that process. And uh, I think if it was a bigger shoot, we would legally have to have an intimacy coordinator. Oh, um, I didn't know that was a, a job title. Yes, that is a, that is a part of production now is um, when like all of the Me Too stuff happened, they, they oh, added I see. on I see. set uh, uh, an intimacy coordinator, but we fall pretty far below that that line <laughs> sure. as far as like legality stuff but um you know it just it was definitely challenging and, and the setup took too long so we ended up filming that whole video in just about three and a half hours uh because the setup took like way too long mm -hmm. um but you know it it was like you know i was having trust in my own intuition you know i'd never seen myself on playback like performing before yeah. um and that was definitely an awkward thing. And I definitely was really critical in the edit about what clips were allowed. I was like, no, I look stupid in that, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I definitely didn't figure it out yet. And there's, I'm, you know, we've been working on new music videos, like getting all the concepts and everything together. And I'm like, all right, here we go again. I'm going to have to like, hopefully not look stupid. Because if I look stupid, it's not only my fault for being the performer, but also my fault for being the director. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've done that with even my own band. I was like, you know, shooting. Like, were you actually like shooting some shots? Oh, yourself? no. We, we, we had a director of photography for that. Oh, okay. Cool. And so with that, you know, like I was trying to be as on top because there's I, I was going for a, a, a very specific visual language with it of like the concept essentially is like a distracted cameraman. You know, it's like... <laughs> like uh, like you're watching this band playing but like what's more interesting than a band playing almost anything but what about a couple making out and fucking and so you're like wait, wait what's going on over here you know like uh and so with that you know it was important to be on the same page with our uh dp justin just to like you know like uh, this is the type of drifting and like Sure. like rack focus that i'm looking for and, and stuff like that that's really and i got to be over i got to be over his shoulder on, on, on in a lot of the shot if there's not a shot with me i'm like i'm like going okay now tilt you know like yeah now, like well, in you're his directing ear, kind of, yeah like, exactly. yeah 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 so no i i really like that concept actually because it kind of um it feels and maybe this this rings a lot truer because we haven't had shows for the longest time but like any set that I would watch, like if I was watching your set from This Is Hardcore, just like sunny, like following the different, you know, like little funny things that people are doing, either yeah. like having really funny mosh moves or just like someone side stage who's like air drumming uh, alongside yeah, yeah. Max, you. That was Max from Spine air drumming in the, um, in the This Is Hardcore video. Just yeah. shout out to Spine. They just dropped a new record too. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah I, I, I really like that concept where it's just like, Oh yeah, bands are cool, but like, what's going on over here? So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know your guitar your guitarist name, um, but it's just funny how the the song ends and he's like standing there and they're like still going at it, like just yeah, yeah. it's not like slowing down because the song is ending. No, no, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's where I was like, I wish I was like a little able to direct more, but that's just one of those things. That's every video, you know, you have things that you wish that you had the time to change. That's the big thing is, you know, on these low budget productions is like, you may have the idea to change something that's not working, but do you have the time to change it? Mm -hmm. Um, so to talk about the, the newest, uh, military gun record, um, am I allowed to say the, the album name? No, 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 not not allowed to not allowed to really disclose too much, you know. Okay, well that that record that will come out at some point. Um, like I said, all the tracks on it. I don't think that there's any sleepers. They all are favorites of mine, and I'm Thank really you. excited for other people to hear it and and uh, share the excitement around it. Um, what do you think is the biggest risk that you took on that record, as far as like, oh, like would it be weird if we added this kind of instrument in here? That's like I've never recorded with that or no, there's nothing that really pushed that direction. I mean, there's Mellotron on a lot of there's Mellotron on most military gun songs. There's Mellotron on every song on My Life Is Over, and then there's like Mellotron on at least half of the LP, okay. um, which is no longer an LP. It's now two EPs. We like it's different things going on all the time. Sure. But um, can you tell I mean, that, tell me what Mellotron is? I actually don't know what that. Is. So Mellotron is this tool that like the Beatles were most known for using. Oh, it, okay. Um, now it's just like a like 
a digital thing, but when you have the real thing, it you you press a key and it plays a physical tape loop. So oh, okay. it has a very specific sound. Like if you listen to Strawberry Fields Forever by the Beatles, like that's the song where it like is most prominently used. Um, I mean, most bands use it because everyone loves the Beatles, you know. Right. Uh, but that is a t- that's just an instrument that I love the fucking way it sounds and and the songs where it's more prominently featured. I like am in love with. So, yeah. um, I I think I when in- you said it, I was like. For some reason, it's not like melatonin, and that would stay in my head. I'm like, <laughs> I, that's not right. But no, no, no. I I didn't take melatonin around that time. I drink a lot of that fucking Nyquil. But yeah. Um, I mean, the the creative risks, I would say, were more just like trying to push myself melodically, and and I do think that you know a lot of the record is is a lot of two note melody, um, which like maybe could get old over time, and I'm really trying to push myself more. You know, I have like. We have we recorded 12 songs in the studio, but I already have 11 more demos since then. And and the goal has been to keep trying and keep trying things and um, just keep pushing. And, you know, like. I I was trying people will hear it when the, eventually the record comes out. But, you know, I was like, I think that there's things that like rock bands don't talk about, like money and drugs and like uh love in in any sort of nuanced way and so i kind of was like you know i'm gonna try to push myself to talk about those things and they came naturally because they're what i'm thinking about anyway you know like i'm thinking you know like damn i wish i had some money or like thinking about something else so um you know just stuff like that was kind of like trying to push i think that it's a very intuitive record and so at times like i get in my head where i'm like because i'm following such a strong intuition in a moment in creation that when it comes time to release it i'm like oh is this underthought is this stupid will someone make fun of me whatever you know like um and that's the process with releasing anything i mean i remember i was really want not wanting dislocate me to come out i was like why is that i was like oh my god this is terrible (laughs) this is like this is uh you know like oh my god this singing stuff is so stupid my voice sounds terrible you know just like like different things you know you get in your head once you start having to when you have to take something from the way you perceive it and then put it onto the public it's uh, that's a scary thing you know and 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 especially if you i think that these songs are so off the hip you know it's just like they're one shot you know every song for the most part for military gun was created in two hours from first riff to vocals and so with that, it can sometimes feel like, oh, should I have thought about this more? What, you know, just like things like that. So we'll see what, how people react to it. But no, I honestly like I, I, I totally agree that like any anything new that you're doing um, there, that is a like a, a definite difference from like past musical, you know, things that are out in the open is like it's daunting to be like, or I don't know if people are going to fuck with this. I remember when Cole from Gulch came on the podcast, he was like. I don't know if people are going to like, l- like understand what we're doing. And now Gulch is like one of the biggest bands in hardcore. Yeah, right now. exactly. Well, I mean, that's the thing is like that insecurity follows like that artistic feeling and, and that is pushing your own boundaries and pushing whatever. And so with that, like, hopefully you're making something distinct. I think it's really easy to make a record that says, I want to create a record that sounds like this record that I already know and love. Mm-hmm. So you know that there's no risk in that. Yeah. Um, Whereas if you're making a record that you're trying to make distinct and, and to yourself, you know, not only that you like you're you've laid yourself bare for people to see, but, you know, it's like you're there's no guarantee people are going to like it because they've never had that exact combination of elements. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, or at least you hope that they've never had that exact combination of elements. And that's really what military guns going for. And then, you know, like I try with my own distinct things in RJC as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Personally, I was, um, I remember the very first time I saw the Dislocate Me music video and I was like, kind of like, like pleasantly surprised by the vocals. Cause I was like, I heard the music and it's, there's always like throwing curveballs in your music. Like you, mm-hmm. you think it's going to transition into this, but it actually like, we're going this route and it's actually way better. So <laughs> to have the, the harshness that I guess people would know on RJC, but still have the melody and have like, Oh, there's like a, like an actual chorus and like a a melody line that people can follow. I thought 
and, and I think it's it it doesn't feel like hey like we're just going so off this way like there is there is a bridge connecting the two the two bands well, that's basically. the thing yeah i mean you don't want it to be like zany you don't want it to be a bunch of things mashed together that shouldn't be and i think that's where a lot of the questioning um that that ends up happening is like is this combination good like it's what was intuitive to me but is it like is it too zany or is it too like left field you know and so that's kind of a a, a struggle of just trying to write music that like hopefully can only come from yourself yeah yeah and and that's the challenge where when you're especially when you're putting out as much music as you are on like a yearly aspect um to have to be confident in your own head like i know what i'm doing and i'm i'm stoked on this and i don't give a fuck if other people aren't but still have influences you know within your close inner circle to check you and be like you should actually play that part uh, double as long or like, yeah, maybe we should I mean, that's, up. it's been interesting. I mean, I think that there's a difference of opinion that you have when you think you have input in music. So like if your friend shows you a record that they're making, you're like, well, I could steer this one way or another. Whereas like, if you're just consuming music, you don't have those thoughts. And I've been trying right. to embrace that and take that in when I show a demo to a friend and they give me a certain note that either I don't like, or maybe is pushing me. Um, you know, like just to, to, to try to like actually take in the notes for what they are sure. and listen to them and uh, like kind of also, but di dissect the fact that knowing that they're taking it in different than they would normal music yeah. because they, they view that they could steer the ship. Yeah, no, that, that is interesting to, to like, like you said, like if you're just listening to music, you're like, I would have actually done that riff differently or add, added this little noodly thing. But when it's more, when it's not out and like concrete and cemented, there's like maybe a little bit more feedback or, or criticisms that come in. in yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. that's very interesting. And that's good. It's a good thing. You know, your friends should push you to make better records. And I definitely do it to my friends and say, you know, whatever. So they do it to me too. Um, yeah. Well, that's, all that is really, really great. Uh, Ian, we should probably start to wrap up the show because I know you got a very tight day uh, for, for press, it sounds like. Yeah, um, this is like the first day for RJC Press. So it's like, um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot yeah. of talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm very honored to even be considered in, in, in a press cycle or whatever. Um, the last uh, segment of this podcast that we always hit on is I ask my guest a favorite mosh story that they would like to share. So it doesn't necessarily need to be like a crazy hit that you saw or like a crazy uh, show moment. Whatever's the first thing to your mind is kind of how we start to wrap up. Uh, okay, so I guess this is this is the first hardcore show I ever went to. Okay. Um, so like I was a street punk. And I, then I started getting into like crust and power violence. And then I found ceremony. It was right when violence violence came out. And so the first like Seattle hardcore show I went to was ceremony, trash talk, allegiance, and this opening band called distract. And I loved low. I really have like always had like a very strong local pride so that the band distract was really cool to me. And I remember seeing one of the members of distract get kicked full force in the, the chest uh, and I was a street punk, so I was like hardcore dancing. Oh, that's so fucking whack, you know. Like right. <laughs> I, I had a different word for it at the time as a yeah. fucking fifteen year old, but um, you know, I just was like, I remember. That, I guess that, that I would just say that the first time I saw hardcore dancing, I was like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like seeing people windmill and do stuff like that is still something that is like so comedic to me. Right. But uh, I just I guess the first thing I think of is just seeing um, someone just get kicked. They were shirtless, too, and it left a footprint. Oh, on his chest. <laughs> and, like full on 300. This is Sparta kick. Just like. Yeah. yeah, no yeah. Well, it was like it was like a like in the back or something, you know, like, oh. I don't know. It was it was just goofy, you know, and I was just like, oh, this is so not what I want to be associated with. Um, and so for the longest time, I remember. Maybe it was during Trash Talk because it was right when Trash Talk 
had walking disease come out. So it's funny because I hated trash talk at first, even though they had blast beats, because I saw the way that people were reacting to them and it wasn't like circle pits and shit. It was like hardcore dancing, yeah. which isn't even a term anymore. If, I don't know if people like I feel like people don't use the word hardcore dancing anymore. Like, what would they be using instead? Like, just moshing or... People just say moshing. I feel like I haven't heard the term hardcore dancing in a long hmm. time. Yeah. Now, that, now that I'm saying it, I feel like it's outdated. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, we're talking, like, 2006 or something like that. Uh, so, quite a few years ago. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. That I guess that's nothing super interesting. I've, like, never hurt myself too too bad. I've never windmilled. I've definitely done like some variation of goofiness with moshing, but sure. no, I, I, I think, you Not know, my vibe. It, it always happens where people come on and then they message me after like, Oh, I should have told these stories, but I think, yeah, you should have primed it. Be like, <laughs> prepare your best moshing story. Maybe I would have come up with something different, but that's just the first one. Yeah. It's literally the first thing that came to mind. Is, well, especially okay, for wait, first... no, wait, here's, here's a good one. Um, so I, the only thing I really like doing ever is jumping off of stuff. And so I saw Limp Wrist in Portland, maybe 2010 or 2011. And um, one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. Uh, absolutely incredible. Just stage, relentless stage diving the entire time and just right. so sweaty. And um, they came on for their encore and it was I Love Hardcore Boys. And I cl started climbing the speaker stack. Okay. And uh, there was a bouncer who tried to grab me. And I was just about the top. So he grabbed my arm, but I was so sweaty that I just went <laughs> and like slipped out of his hands and then just like jumped off of the speaker stack. And uh, I think about it now. I mean, he was right to try to pull me off because I was, it was a big drop. So I, whoever I landed on, I probably fucked up. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I was pretty light at the time. Yeah. Not that I'm heavy now, but uh, yeah, that, that was. That's my favorite moment. Probably just jump. That was probably the biggest jump. It was probably like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of how it was probably, you know, 20 foot drop or something like that. Yeah. Like it was, it was a pretty big, big jump. So, yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that extra story. And I think it's, I love the visual that you were just so moist that just any, any clutch that he could have just like, yeah, he had me and it was just like, <laughs> just, yeah. S slippier than WD 40, if anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, no, that's really sick. Um, Ian, this has been a blast. Um, you know, con like seeing the constant output of music and all the stuff that you're doing uh, creatively is is truly inspiring to, to see all that. Um, Thank you. Anything you want to plug, shout out, um, the floor is yours for whatever you want to end off with. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Regional Justice Center, uh, Crime and Punishment LP is rolling out now on Closed Casket. Um with that, I mean, I guess I shouldn't really plug anything else. Video Prick today just dropped a two-song flexi. That's like the RJC uh, family tree type shit. Uh, che and Alex from RJC are in that band. Uh, Steph has uh, Apple White, which just dropped an awesome LP. And there's also Punitive Damage, who's about to record an LP. I don't know if I'm allowed oh. to say that. But um, so, so yeah, I mean, that that's really it is, you know, like, uh, I guess – you know, there's probably a no shortage of bands I could promote that like share members with RJC, but those are the ones that come to mind. So definitely. And all of the, the stuff that Ian and I have been talking about will be in the show notes, the description of the video. Um, again, Ian, I appreciate, and I hope that when shows come back, um, can see all the new RGC stuff, um, in a 2021, uh, landscape, a live setting, uh, you let's know, hope, let's hope. your guys is set, uh, at wild Rose, I guess it would have been last year was one I was, uh, very much looking forward to, um, just to see the difference from the, the first time that I saw you guys with been grown. So, Oh, definitely. Yeah. I forgot that, that we were supposed to play that. That's crazy. We have so many flights that we canceled. So now we have all these flight credits because it was like early days of COVID and sure. the, most places just wouldn't give us a fucking refund. But yeah, I forgot that we we're supposed to go out to Calgary and play wild Rose. That's <laughs> insane. Yeah. It's insane how many flights we had yeah. that we just can't, we just nothing. We can't do anything with. Yeah. It will be interesting to see when the, 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 the corner of the page that's being turned over when shows do come back and the amount of flights that are being booked and, and all that. Yeah. Is just I'll tell you what, I'm window. already booking. Oh, okay. Uh, and so anyone else who's slacking, 
uh, or not having the foresight to try to pull stuff together, like y'all got to get going because, you know, the, the professional, and this is just my DIY advice because I'm booking a DIY tour right now, is the professionals have fucking started and have just continued rolling, rolling over their holds. Yeah. And so if you want to tour in fall 21, if they are allowing it, like you just got to get going. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you're writing music or trying to figure out a tour for the end of the year, um, I feel like every hardcore band should be working um, as much as they can right now. So, again, Ian, thanks for coming on the podcast with me and jamming. This has been a blast. Awesome. Thank you.